David, where, where, where are you at? Actually, I'm in San Diego, California right now. So you're right down the street from me. I'm in, I'm in Marietta. I drove through Marietta coming in from Las Vegas last night. What were you doing in Las Vegas? Uh, we actually split our time between Vegas and San Diego. I do a lot of uh, outdoor training for like marathons and Ironmans and stuff like that. And I kind of prefer to do it in the heat. Uh, and the roads in Vegas are a lot less uh, crowded, so it appears to be. Uh, I just, I just like it out there. Hell, we could have set this up and done it in person. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just want to jump right into it. I want to. I, I know you have a story, right? And, and this is hindsight. Then there's a reason that you did what I'm about to talk about. But I really just want to jump into the bike ride across the country. Right now, verify this for me. Is it a bicycle or is it a motorcycle? I get that question a lot because people are like, dude, I mean, we're talking, you know, nearly 5,000 miles by bike. You mean motorcycle, right? And I said, no, I'm the motor on a two wheel cycle. So it's it's a regular bicycle. That is And What made you come up with that? That I know you do a lot of training and we'll get to that as well. But what made you put Maybe let's start from the beginning. I'm I'm jumping all the way in the middle, right? <laughs> <laughs> so let's yeah. let's start from the beginning. When did you start um, doing triathlons? What got you into that? Because that's pretty that's that's pretty intense. Yeah, it's pretty intense. I didn't I didn't uh, expect to uh, go into that. Um, I don't know hobby endeavor, whatever you want to call it. Um, I was in my late 30s, and I was in a super low point in my life, and I I. I needed to make some changes. I was an overweight smoker. I was completely stressed out at work. I was in an exceptionally unhealthy marriage. Uh, I had two young twins. And it was just a super, super low period. And through a number of different things that happened, I was able to, like, for the first time in my life, kind of look in the mirror and see myself for who I really was. And I didn't like a lot. I like some of it, but I didn't like all of what I saw. And I said, man, you got, you got to start somewhere. So I, I used running, beginning to run as a, a really good replacement for smoking. I mean, you, can't, you can't really run and, and smoke. And I had never tried to quit smoking. Uh, and I figured, well, it, I don't want to fail at that. So in order to not fail at that, I better do stuff that's going to prevent me from smoking. So I started running and then that led to uh, biking and swimming because the more I could fill my time with moving around, uh, the the harder it would be to reach for a cigarette. And also, it helped me lose weight and right. whatever. And then w- one event led to another and another and another. And and I I I loved. I was drawn to uh, Lee the idea of setting goals that only I cared about and and no so. You know, I mean, we all have to do stuff our teachers say and our bosses say and whatever. But, but um, how often do we set goals really high for ourselves? So I just said I got, I kind of got consumed by that idea, and that led me to doing half Ironmans and marathons and eventually Ironmans and fifty mile runs and hundred mile runs and even even a lot more like a fi- like a five thousand mile bike ride. You you mentioned that you were in a in a pretty uh, low part. A, a low stage in your life. Mm-hmm. What triggered you to want to make a change? <laughs> I don't know that I did want to make a change, right? Okay. Because I wasn't aware that I needed to until I was aware that I needed to. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's sounds trite, like you only know what you know when you know it. But honestly, you only you only know what you know when you know it. And right. And uh, what what triggered me was. When, when all that stuff I mentioned was going on, you know, a, really a, a rough part of, of life. Uh, I had a really good friend who I had, had for a few years and, and he was, he was the one person I felt I could, 
open up to and 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 really you know kind of bring him into my inner feelings about what the heck was going on in my life and so one night i just remember very clearly uh one, one night i was complaining to him about all, all the bad things going on and all the bad you know bad luck and mean people and you know bad situations and whatever and he just stood up and he looked at me and he goes man i am so sick of hearing about all these problems you have he goes every everything in your life turns out to be a rabid dog he goes and mm. then you go to pet it and it bites you and you get all hurt he goes don't you understand if you're gonna pet rabid dogs they're gonna bite you and you're gonna get hurt he goes why don't you start worrying about your own problems like why don't you you're the problem like you why, why do you keep going after rabid dogs dude and i'm like wow like that's the first time i ever really heard that you right. know like maybe i was the problem and so that was a big catalyst for change for me because it just struck me that maybe I'd heard it a hundred different ways. I, I'm not sure. Maybe I told myself a hundred different ways, but until that moment, I, it, it just never hit me like, holy cow, I might be the problem. Like, like, why am I attracting the wrong people? Why am I making the wrong decisions? Why am I committed to the wrong things in life? And, and that, that allowed me the ability to go, Oh, maybe you ought to worry about yourself. Maybe you ought to think about what, what you're doing right or wrong. You had a, a good friend that gave you some tough love. It, it really was, but it came at the right time. Had it come uh, any later or early, any later might have been too late. received it, yeah. Yeah, any earlier, I, I probably wouldn't have heard it, right? Right. It just happened to come at the right time and when there was so much more going on that, um, that it was just, it was, like you said, it was, the right thing at the right time. So you got the message, you heard the message and you just jumped into doing marathons. Like how did, how did that transition go? Uh, so I, I mean, you know, let's, let, let's be honest. You can't just say, okay, I'm an overweight, never moved in my life smoker and I'm going to go do a marathon. I mean, it's just not possible. Right? So memories that are really important to you, you're going to, you're going to, they're going to stick with you. And, what stuck with me after Chris told me, you know, Hey dude, take a look in the mirror was I got to take a look in the mirror. And, and I really looked in the mirror. Like I stood there for like 45 minutes one night, my kids were asleep. We we're, we we're safe. We we're out of that, out of that situation. And I, I stood up in front of the mirror and, and I said, man, who are you? You know, like what, what in the world is going on? And I think I saw myself for the first time and I said, okay, well, if, if this is the first time you're seeing yourself, just start at the beginning. You want to be a runner? Start at the beginning. Go run two minutes. And I got this big idea on my head that I could go run two minutes. And I, I, there's no way I could have even made it close to two minutes. I mean, not, right? No, not even possible. It was the worst feeling in the world. But I said, okay, don't fail at it. So then I ran two minutes the next day. And then I ran three minutes and then five minutes. And probably within, I think... I quit smoking at the end of a January. And so it was about six weeks before I did my first 5k, which is about 3.1 miles. Okay. And yeah. then, uh, in April, so about another month later, I, I did a 10 K, which is 6.2 miles. And then by then I had started to swim and jumped on a bike. So I started to do those mini triathlons. And then by July I did a half Ironman. And then I was just like, man, could you imagine you like this, this, this non-athletic overweight smoker guy who, you know, some people would think, you know, a lot of your life's behind you. And I'm going, well, what the heck, man, maybe I should just try an Ironman. So uh, in November of that year, I did my first Ironman and I've done 17 or 18 since and, and a whole lot more. Wow. That's inspirational. I'll tell you, um, I'm trying to, and I'm not aspiring to, to be an Ironman, but I'm trying to get my fitness level back up. And I had put on some weight after I got out of the military. And I remember every time I went to the doctor, I don't care what it was, uh, you know, they were like, hey, you need to lose some weight. And so I said, okay, I need to start from the beginning. I can't start mm -hmm. like how I was in the military. I got to start. Uh, so I got out and I tried to do a push up, couldn't do any. And eventually I pulled out one. And then the next day I did two. 
And then eventually I did three. And when I got to 10, I said, I'm going to do 10 until it feels comfortable and then I'll move on. Right. And so you, you develop a plan. So when, when you looked in the mirror Mm -hmm. and you took a good look at yourself and you saw where you were at that moment, were you able to visualize where you wanted to be? Uh, not, no, not, not, not at all. No, no, I had no clue what what I, what I knew was that, um, I, I didn't really carry it as a, as an outward, like massive chip on my shoulder. And, And I certainly wasn't cynical inside or out, but I think I was limited by all the bad things that had happened to me either by circumstance or by my bad decisions or sticking with the wrong thing for too long or whatever the, whatever the reasons are. Right. I think I had these chips on my shoulder. Um, and I, I, I mean, I know it sounds, it sounds silly to say this, Ali, but I just, I, I, until that time, I didn't even really care. I didn't notice who I was and who, where I was and who I wanted to be. I didn't have a clear understanding and I had been through super, super low, low lows and I had been through some pretty good highs and I still had no sense of who I was. And so I, I you know, I, you know, you, you, this is hindsight, right? I only knew in yeah. hindsight what right. the, what, what the process was and what led me to where I'm at today. I only know it was a three-step process for me. And that first thing was what we talked about is that looking in the mirror, like not figuratively, like literally like like you right, laying right, down right. and trying to do a push up that's looking in the mirror right? right and 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 you could say oh man who needs to do push ups or you could say ah oh, push ups are stupid or you could say oh, i used to be able to do push ups too late now but you said no 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 let's look in the mirror you can only do none let's get to one right <laughs> right and, and 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 then you and then you build it and you figure out who you are and so for me the looking in the mirror was step 1 you know step 2 was just probably you, you have to do this too. It's just, just like, forgive yourself, just free your mind and go, okay, I can't do a hundred pushups right now. I can't do 10. I can't even do one. Just forgive yourself. Just, just get out there and try. And so, um, I had to kind of like free my mind and, and forgive myself. And then that led me to number three, which was to lean in and learn. And what I, what I found out through doing, uh, athletic events is I had no idea who I was or who I could be because I had never focused on me. I had always focused on the task at hand. And even if it, it, even if the task was, was my own doing, you know, like, like trying to fix a relationship or trying to be better at work or whatever. Um, it, 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 I had no idea who I was and who I wanted to be. That's why I had to lean in and find, find out, but I had to let go. You know, I had to forgive myself, just free my mind, just let go of all the crap. Right. in order that I could find out so that it, it, I had no clue. Yeah. And that was a fun part, right? Yeah. That's, that, that was a that's fun the part. important part. <laughs> yeah. That was the important part. You know, like when somebody says to you, Lee, like they're like 40 years old and, and you go, Hey, come on over for barbecue. And they go, Oh, Matt, fantastic. And I go, I go, Oh my God, you're going to, you're going to love this meal. I'm, I'm cooking up some steak and fish. And they go, Oh no, I'll eat the steak, but I don't eat fish. And I go, why? Oh, fish is terrible, man. I never eat fish my whole life. And I'm like, right. what? Like, like, how do you eat? like what? I mean, billions <laughs> of people eat fish and in and, 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 and hundreds or if not thousands of different way. And you're telling me you already know everything about fish that there is that, you know, the fish is not good. I realized not only did I not know everything, I didn't know anything. <laughs> right. Right. I didn't know anything. So it was it was a pretty uh fun time for me because I could try to figure stuff out. That's really, that's, that's really important message. And I appreciate you sharing because you know, the whole, the whole concept of hindsight is to really look back, right? Look back, see, and, and take some of the, the things that you've done that were good. Some of the things that you did were bad, right? And visualize where you want to be, continue to make mm-hmm. those goals. And you do it because if you, if, if you're stuck in always, and don't take this the wrong way, if you're stuck always in your present self, then it's difficult to grow. You know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? If you can't look beyond Mm -hmm. your present self Mm -hmm. and you and you experience or or you give uh, responses or you, you know, make decisions based off your current circumstances and not really taking a glance at where you really want to be in the future and how that decision may impact your future self. 
then it's difficult to get there. Yeah, that's that's so perfectly well said. Let me let me give you a uh, a real life example of how how that is exactly the way my mind worked through this whole thing, and that is that I was doing a eighty seven mile rollerblade race in Georgia. Okay, it was. I mean, what what kind of idiots get together and and, and, yeah, what kind of idiots rollerblade eighty seven miles? And I, I, there was a first event that I did that was anything of distance. So I, I mean, you know, like I had done a little bit of running and a little bit of biking or whatever, but but I had never done anything remotely close to eighty seven miles on rollerblades. Right. And about thirty miles in, Lee, I was it. That's it. I hit the wall. I mean, I was done. Yeah, could not move. Could, could literally could not move, and I was I was trying to rollerblade, you know, inch by inch up this hill, and I was just like, "No, nah, man, you're done." And, and and I there's no way I could have made up that hill, let alone another fifty odd miles. And so I leaned, uh, you know, turned turned perpendicular to the hill. I leaned over on my knees, and I was just it was hot. I was sweating. I was just done. And I and and I had this like 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 line of sweat just rolling down the mountain mm-hmm. and I went, Hmm, okay. You got two, two options. One, you, you just go downhill and pack it in, wait for the sag wagon to come get you. And, and you'll go home knowing everything you ever knew about yourself, right? which isn't a bad thing. I mean, it's a good thing to know, to know what your limits are and where you're at, but, but I would have known everything, but like what you said, it's j- just try to figure it out and, and see who you're going to become. And then, and then reach for that. I just go, okay, well, make one more step. Because if, if you go one more step, David, you're going to learn something. And you're going you're gonna to discover something new about yourself. And then, then something more is going to be in the future for you to find out. And each step was that. E- each step was like, it wasn't one more step. It, was, it Certainly it was painful or whatever. But all it was was a learning experience. And, and like five and a half, six hours later, I finally made it to the finish line. And, and it's only because I, I said, man, I got to find out. I got to find out who I am. I got to find out how much pain I can handle. I got to find out if I can recover, you know, is it physical or mental? Like what, what, like how much, you know, determination do you have or quitting you do you have or whatever, all those things wrapped up. And, and it was like this, like, like if I stayed in my present moment, I would have been done. I would have gone home I, and it wouldn't have been a bad thing. I would have known that I needed to go a different way in life, but, but you had, you know, I had to let go of the present, just, just see where I could go. That is a great story. And that's difficult, right? Because your mind, whoo, your mind can really, I mean, your body too, but your mind has such power. And if you can tap in to that, right, just controlling your mind, controlling your self doubt. Um, that's a good story. I know uh, when we were in the army, we used to, we used to go for a run and, and our colonel, he used to run us around Hawaii. And uh, we, would, we would be coming back to where we started at. And I used to always tell my guys, hey, get your mind right, get your mind right. <clears throat> because he would run past the entrance, you know what I'm saying, and go like another mile out yep. and then come <laughs> back, right? Just, to, just right. to mess with your mind. It's crazy how you see how many people just get right to that entrance and they just give up. They just stop. Because their yeah. mind failed them at that point, you know. Yep. Um, so that's a great story. The uh, eighty-seven mile you said. That one was eighty eighty-seven miles. I eighty-seven think. mile yeah. roller blading. I've never yeah. heard of such. <laughs> uh, tell me about it. <laughs> that's tell me awesome, about it. Though. By, by the way, Lee, that was a race that gone on for like thirty years, right? And, and so it wasn't like some a bunch of wackos getting together one time. I mean, this thing was a year after year after year thing, and so. When I found out about it, I'm like, I got to find out what this is all about. And I realized, man, I was so far over my head. It was not even funny. But you figure out a way to do it, you know? Yeah, you figure. And you learned a lot about yourself doing it. So yeah. that's that's whew, that's crazy. I don't like roller skating or rollerblading or anything like that. I'm just, I'm not really, I'm not that balanced. I used to, but funny enough, uh, when I was younger, I won't do it now because I'm a lot older, but I used to ice skate. But roller skating... I didn't get it. So, uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, skateboarding? Yeah. I couldn't do it. But ice skating, I could do that. It's crazy. Yeah, I'm not coordinated either, Lee. So, it was it was, it was was ridiculous. So, that me. made it even harder for you. Yeah, because trust me when I tell you I am not coordinated. I'm like you. I'm not coordinated. 
So tell me about your first book, Winning in the Middle of the Pack. What inspired that? And that's a that's a really unique title that makes you think like winning. How do you win from the middle of the pack? Have you ever watched a marathon? What happens in a marathon, Lee, is is let's say you take the Boston Marathon or the LA Marathon or or even your local marathon. The first 20 people take off. The winner's coming from those 20, always. And the winner never comes of the marathon, never comes from the middle of the pack. Okay. That they never do. The the 20 and then five peel off and 10 peel off and four four more peel off. And then the last six, you know, make it to to the last couple of miles. And then, and then somebody peels away from that. So the winner of the marathon always comes from the front pack. So wh- where it came from was after I had done a ton of different Ironmans and half Ironmans, 50 mile runs, whatever, I thought to myself, you know, there's a heck of a lot of parallels between life and between business. I, at the time I was running a very large business for a, for a Wall Street firm. I think revenues were like hundred, hundred ten million million in revenue. So pretty big business. And there was a lot of parallels between doing endurance athletics and doing Ironmans and, 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 and business and life. And I thought, you know, I had never, I had never thought about the middle of the pack. And for me, what that meant is let me, let me tell you another quick story, what middle of the pack means. So I, I, my very first half Ironman, I'm still very much not in shape, right? I'm still very overweight. And, uh, I, I, yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm barely trying to figure this thing out. And I go to the start line cause it's one of these wave starts where, where they just, you know, put a hundred people, different age groups, one after the other, cause it's in a river. You can't do a mass start. And, and I walk up to the start line Lee and, and I'm looking down into the river and everybody looks like a Greek God. I mean, they're wearing their speedos and there is an ounce of fat between the, between the hundred people down there. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Look, I mean, look at the, look at these people. These are athletes. Like what the hell are you even doing here? And and I got so self-conscious and I got so convinced that I was not in that lead pack that I just said, oh man, you got to go home. Like, 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 don't, you do not belong here. This is not the world you, you live in. And then the gun went off and yeah, some swimmers took off. Yeah, no doubt. But, but one dude flopped on his back and started doing a doggy paddle thing. And another guy started swimming in circles and, and somebody else walked cause they couldn't swim. They were walking on the rocks and trying to find their way down the And I'm like, Holy cow, man. Like they don't, they're not self-conscious. They don't care. I'll look at all the people on the banks of the river watching them. They could, they could care less. And I went, huh? Okay. So they're not going to win. They certainly aren't going to, aren't going to quit. Like they're not going to go home. Right. Right. Because they think they belong there. Maybe they're just running their own race. Maybe they're just somewhere in the middle of the pack and they could care less if anybody's watching or, or, or what anybody cares, they're just going to do it for them. Right. And it hit me that, you know, all the lessons I learned in business, I never applied to myself. And one of those, which I brought to, you know, to, to athletics and, and it was, it was just magnified was, Man, you got to do something for yourself. If if your if your lieutenant is telling you to do something and you don't want to do it, there's a likelihood that you're not going to do it. But if you can change your mind, like you said, and you go, "No, I need to do this because I'm going to be the best I can be," th- then there's a totally different mindset. And um, and I think winning in the middle of the pack. Sorry for the long answer, Lee. No, but true. for me, winning in the middle of the pack meant I'm not Oprah Winfrey, man. I'm never going to be that. Uh, I'm not Michael Jordan. You know, I'm never going to be that. And that's okay. Cause, cause how many Oprah Winfrey's in the world are there? So, 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 but that's okay. But I'm also not going to be the guy who's living on the couch, uh, 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 watching reruns on Netflix, drinking beers and, and not trying anything. So I'm definitely not going to be either ends of those spectrums. I'm somewhere in the middle, you know, 99% of us are in the middle. Right. And so in the middle of the pack, maybe, maybe you ought to just worry about you, like, like, like care about what you think of your effort, care about what you think your, your results, your path in life, your choices, because nobody else really is watching, man. And nobody cares. They're running their own race. I think that's something. Yeah. Right. So winning in the middle of the pack, uh, means that, that you do, you, you win for yourself. Now, now, now look, I I do charity work. Everybody does like things for other people. I'm not saying be selfish, but, but if you choose 
to, to go do something, no matter what it is, do it because it's what you want to do and, and do it, you know, do it at what, whatever level of success you, you qualify as. That is a great answer. I can only speak for myself, but a lot of times, you know, we find ourselves grading ourselves on someone else's or, or your perception of someone else's reality. Right. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that's a great illustration, you know, that you gave of the guys looking like Greek goddesses or gods, not goddesses, (laughs) you know, they got these sculpted bodies, but then when the whistle goes, like you're looking like, what is going on? Right. And you understand that that belief that you had of, you know, or that perception that you had of them was not totally accurate. Right. And maybe I can compete and maybe I should just focus on me. Then I worry about what this person has or where this person's level is. I need to focus on where I am and where I'd like to be. And that's an mm-hmm. important and amazing message. Yeah, I appreciate that it, story it, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Lee, you think uh, LeBron James gives a, a hoot about what anybody in the world thinks about him? No. He could care. He could care less. Neither does no. Elon Musk. Right. They don't care about what anybody thinks because why they're doing everything for them and a lot of the a lot of stuff they do is good is for other people but but it's for them and they could care less what you tell them what their limits are or what they should or shouldn't be doing and we can take something from that the problem is that what we often try to do is compare ourselves to other people and and i just wanted to to look in the mirror and compare myself to to um, are you being the best you not are you being them you know, like in business, I, I wasn't, I, I never worried about like, like, could I be as good as somebody else? I was always worried, like, like, can I do the best that I'm doing? Right. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's you know, water finds its own level eventually. And and if you're, you know, if you're, if it, I don't care what, what you're doing, uh, private sector, public sector, what, whatever water finds its own level, man. And if, you, and if you're putting out effort and you got quality, eventually that's going to happen. But, but, but and when we look in the mirror, we, we don't often think that way. And so, um, you know, I just, I, 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 the winning in the middle of the pack book just has a story after story like that, that kind of helps us rewire our minds to think about, like, I got to care about the person in the mirror more than anybody else. Right. I love it. All right. So now I can get to what I started talking about at the beginning. Uh, I was mm-hmm. talking about the 5,000 mile from California, what did it say, from California to Florida and then to New York? Yeah. In, yeah and, not the greatest line either, but yeah. <laughs> and uh-huh. in your newest, um, is Cycles of Lives, or Cycle of Lives, is that your newest book? Yes, it is. Uh huh. Yeah. So so now we can catch up. And what what, first of all, we got the marathons and all that. And now, you know, actually from having this conversation, I kind of get it. You're a, you're a person who likes these distance uh, setting goals, but what Mm -hmm. made you come up with the concept of one doing that journey across the country? And then two, uh, what you did, the stops that you made along the way, just talk Mm -hmm. about that a little bit. Uh, Sure. So thank you. Um, The, when I was, uh, just beginning the first few steps of this, this, you know, experience, trying to figure out who I was, I I saw this long pathway ahead of me, right? Like, oh man, you got a long way to go. Aren't you lucky? Right. You're going to figure out a lot of stuff. And that was very exciting for me. And at this, but at the same time in the background, um, right, right then when, when my buddy Chris, you know, said, look in the mirror. And when I finally said, you got to worry about, you know, taking care of yourself before, before anything else. At that same time, my sister, uh, had, had informed me that she had been diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. Right. And I was really close to my sister, uh, both in age and we were pretty close at that time in our lives as well. And, um, I was just struck in by the, the duality of here I am starting to go on this journey. That's you know going to lead to who knows where. Right. And she's going to go on a journey that's going to lead to her death. And, and it was, uh, it was really stark for me. And so we talked, we, we, we talked about a lot. She had a husband, you know, great marriage, you know, two young kids, uh, 
great job, great circle of friends, you know, really had settled into being the best her and living a living her best life. And and we had a lot of talks. We 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 you know, we kind of try to uh reconcile a lot of things in our heads and deal with all the emotions and and all of that. But I noticed that that wasn't really common for people to talk about the emotional side of what they were going through. And 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 as I as I watched June and as I really paid attention to all that was around her and uh, you know hospitals and fundraising events and you name it. Um I realized that people were really good about tasks like you know, like, like, I mean, you know, this probably more than anybody in the army, like, like, you know, triage, man, just, just deal with the tasks at hand and, and right. make a list of, of what's important and, and just start, just start prioritizing and get, get into all the tasks. But when it, when you, when, when you take a deep breath and the tasks are, uh, under control, then when we, when we, when we go to face the emotion and talk about, about the emotional side of this thing, whatever it is that's going on, whether it's, you know, PTSD or cancer or abuse or drug addiction or abandonment or whatever, when it comes to the emotional side, we just don't talk about it. And, and, and that's the same for doctors and nurses and loved ones and survivors. And it doesn't matter if people are just fearful of the cancer or if they've dealt with it their whole life, whether they have a great marriage and great friends, or they're all alone in the world. It was very common at some level that people didn't talk about the emotional side of it. And I wanted to try to figure out why. So what I did Lee was I accumulated over a period of time uh, by, by asking friends, by cold calling uh, cancer centers, by, by uh, asking for referrals of referrals of referrals uh, about who had evocative, interesting, inspiring stories that we might be able to learn something from and answer that question. Like, why is it so hard to talk about the emotional side of, of things? Right. And so for a couple of years, I interviewed these people and got super deep into their heads and dealt with all the things that kind of could give us some insight into that question. And then uh, what led me to the bike ride was that I, I you know, I kind of came to the, I, I set out with it with the same quest and I came to the same conclusion that we're all connected by emotion and we're all connected by story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's about it. You know, that's about it. And, and so if we're connected uh, by story and by emotion, and I'm writing a, a book about emotions by telling all these people's stories, why don't I try to connect them? And so I got on my bike and I visited as many of them as I could, as I zigzagged my way across and up the country uh, just to kind of connect the story. So it was just one, one more way to provide some connection. Right. So, so the book itself, Lee, it has the 15 stories, which are all individual stories that give us real insight into the human experience, especially as it relates to the emotional side of, of cancer, trauma, you know, whatever else. And then in between each story is a little, a tiny little bite sized chapter, tiny little expose of, of part of my bike ride across the country where I met all these incredible people and others along the way and dealt with the difficulty of, of, of taking on that kind of task. And then also a little bit of talking about my own uh, emotions behind losing my sister. Right. Wow. Whew. Okay. Long answer. Sorry. Another long answer, man. You no, bring, it's not. You bring, it's you bring not... out the long answers in me. <laughs> it's not a long, it's not as a long answer. It's a powerful answer, you know, yeah. cause it's all about the stories. I mean, you know, humans have been doing that since the beginning of time, right. Telling those yep. stories. And it yep. seems like probably more so, I don't know, recently I'm, I'm not a historian or really have ever studied the topic, but it seems like we have uh, started taking a lot of the emotions, you know, out of the stories that are being told, you know, especially if you look at news and you just see something fire does this. Okay you know, storm does that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. We're mm -hmm. kind of immune to it a little bit. Right. And so to hear someone to, to really go out and first interview these people and then go out and visit them and really truly get their, their story and their essence and their emotion, right. Is, is very impactful. So not, not a long answer, but a very powerful one. So I appreciate that. Yeah, sure. And, and it was, it was tough, right? Because what, what I wanted to do when I found out stories, I wanted to find out, like, for example, 
like you take one, her name is, is, is Jen, nurse, nurse Jen. And, and I wonder, like I, I somebody introduced you know, I was asking around for stories and somebody said, man, you got to meet my, my daughter-in-law. She's literally the happiest, most grounded, most wonderful person you've ever met in your whole life. And I'm like, yeah, right. Whatever. And she goes, no, 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 no. Listen, I'm telling you, this girl is amazing. And I'm like, all right, I'll talk to her. What, what's the story? And she goes, well, you, you need to talk to her. But she uh, she lost her dad to cancer when when she was six years old. Yeah. And he grew up in a in a household with, without a father. And she, she literally couldn't be the more grounded, happier, optimistic, inspiring person you ever met. And so I wanted to find out why. How, how does somebody do that? And when I when I went you know, deep into her story. I, I talked to her, I talked to her best friend from when she was a little girl, you know, and, and I spoke to her for over about a year period. I really got some insight into like how in the world she was able to reconcile this whole thing of watching her dad die and, at such a young age and how it didn't dampen uh, her love for life, her, her, you know, her, her desire to live the best fulfilling carefree, you know, giving life ever. And I'm just like, wow. And I got to write that, uh, right. I don't got to, I get to write this story out and then send it to her and go, Hey, what do you think? I mean, yeah. that's a big responsibility, yeah. right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And so, and so I, I had to take it very serious and, and, and the only people that made the book were people that were very serious about wanting to give me the insight in, into right. stories that would be evocative enough that the reader would go, Oh man, like, wow, I could take something from that. Yeah. Um, so it was a big responsibility both ways. So you could imagine when, when, after I'd spoke to people, when we first finally met face to face, it was pretty, it was a pretty big deal. It was pretty emotional, you know, cause we had been through so much on, on the discussions. We had gone so deep and many times Lee into things where everybody I spoke to, you know, Jen included, obviously, uh, said, you know, boy, I never really talked about this. All right, let's let's talk about it. Yeah. So so what do you hope readers will take away uh, from reading this book? Well, that's a great question, because it's the only reason I wrote the book was to answer that question. Right. And, and I don't have the answers, uh, but but I wanted to give people a little bit of insight into how Oh, others that were going through things like this could answer. Yeah. And what I wanted them, what I wanted the reader to, 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 to get from the book is just a little bit deeper, more in, you know, and more insight into the human experience when it, when it comes to trauma. Cause we, we always go like, Oh, well, I can imagine how hard that is. I, I could imagine what you went through, uh, you know, or, or we don't imagine. And so, we can't imagine. Right. And so we either know the answer, which, which is not good when, when somebody's going through something difficult and you're like, Oh, I know, I know, dear, I know what you're going through. No, you don't yeah. like, like, no, you don't. Right. Right. Or the other thing is, is we can't even imagine what people are going through and we go, Oh heck, I'm not even going to get in that in the middle of that because I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. What the heck if they tell me something I can't handle? How am I going to react? Are they going to see it on my face? They're going to, you know, oh, like I don't even know, like, 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 oh, I'm sorry, and see you later. Like I, like I, like I gotta, I gotta go. And that's normal. And and what I wanted people to get out of the book was to sit back and go, hmm. So that's what people might be going through. So when my friend says to me, I know my friend's going through something, Lee. And when my friend says to me, not nah, really, Lee, I'm good. Like, I, I'm good. I'm, I'm all right, man. I, I don't need anything right now. Right. That maybe there's a lot more, <clears throat> excuse me, behind that, behind that, then they just don't need you. Like, right. like they don't need anything right now. Maybe. And, and I wanted to be able to empower people with some tools on how to, how to ask the right questions, how to start the hard conversations of, of getting a better connection. So in that example, I might, I might say to you, Lee, you're telling me that you're okay and that you don't need anything. And, and I'm sorry to get in your space, but dude, you gotta be going through something that, that, that you gotta talk about, right? Like I'm here for you. I'm not gonna abandon you. I don't wanna say the wrong thing, but I certainly don't wanna want, want to isolate, isolate you. So talk to me, buddy, what the heck is going on? Right. Right. Which is hard to do. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's much easier to go, oh, you don't need anything? Okay, thanks. All right, see you later. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So much easier to do that. And so um, I think these stories are so inspiring and so relatable because who hasn't had trauma? Maybe we don't understand what it's like for somebody to get cancer, to lose somebody in an accident or whatever. Maybe we can't ever understand that. But we can understand how they've been abandoned in life or abused or or had drug addiction or made bad decisions or were just, you know, uh, uh, left standing at the altar. We we can understand those things. We can wrap our brains around them. And so how those things might affect what they're going through now, um, that they'll give us a little more uh, insight into the human experience and maybe, maybe just empower us to connect with people on a deeper level. What are you working on now? Like, what is your, what is your mission? Well, uh, yeah, I'm still doing endurance athletics. I'm yeah. a little bit older now, but I'm still doing them. Right. Uh, just a half Ironman a couple months ago. Got a, got a half marathon coming up. I'm going to do the Hawaii Ironman, actually, the, the world championships next year. Right. And, and so, uh, so I'm still doing that. Um, I'm still trying to f- figure out who I'm going to be, right? In, in a lot yeah, of different it's ways. It's always that's a continual exploration, right? Well, hopefully, like I, I like I think my friend Chris, because I, I don't know if I didn't hear that at that that point, I might already know everything and not be exploring. I might yeah. be looking in the rearview. I might be looking in the rearview mirror, right? Right. Um, so I'm still doing that, and I'm um, I'm still writing uh, the, with the Cycle of Lives project. The the cool thing about it is my my wife and I said. Hey, why don't we just put every everything that comes in from from this? We'll just uh, give to to the charities that the book participants had an affinity towards. So right. they all chose a different charity, and they're, they're listed in the book and listed on my website. So all the proceeds from this book go to uh, go to charity. So I'm going to continue, hopefully, for the next several years to talk about the book and try to bring attention to this topic because. Um, I just think it's an important one. I mean, how many, how many times do you know, somebody said, uh, so close to my dad or I was so close to my, my brother or whatever, but man, man, I wish I would have asked him this, or I wish, wish we would have talked about that all the time. Yeah. All the time. And so I don't, you know, so I'm, I don't think I'm going to stop trying to promote this idea. And then I got other books I'm working on. I'm working on some fiction books some nonfiction books and, Oh, Hopefully, uh, uh, you know, uh, not a lot of people make a living from writing, but, <laughs> you know, like, like hopefully the writing's good enough that people say, hey, what, what do you got next? You know, and and also I just want to put out there, uh, the website is cycleoflives.org. Uh, so uh, the listeners can go out there and, and check that out and and uh, learn just a little bit of, a little bit more about the uh, Cycle of Lives project. And, uh, I guess, do you keep, do you keep that up to date? Do you continue oh, yeah. to add new things? It's okay. very up to date. And, 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 and I talk about, um, I, 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 I do a lot of other things. Like I, I run expressive writing workshops and I talk about that on there and I, and I do public speaking. I got, I got stuff on that there. And okay. anytime there's any kind of fun news or, you know, something that I think could be helpful to the community Then I, I put that it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely kept, it's kept uh, very up to date. Give us uh, something I didn't ask you, or maybe it is a final message. Uh, something that you just like to, to get out to the audience that you feel is important that they need to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can't assume anything, but I'm going to assume like take, take, take you for an example, right? Yeah. Um, you're out there trying something new. You're obviously very good at it and, and bringing, bringing stories. No, I really mean that you're, you're a great question asker. You're very present. You're very intuitive, but, but you know, you don't have 500 episodes under your belt right? and have built this huge community. You're, you're embarking on that and you're somewhere along that path, but you didn't even know it until you just said, Oh, what the heck? I'm going to give this a shot. And, and I, and I love that. I love that idea in life that you could, just not know and just see, okay, here's what I'm looking to do. And if you do it and it doesn't work, you go do something else and something else and something else. And so I don't know, I, I, I guess what inspires me is not 
seeing you know Tom Brady come back for another year because we already know he's the all time greatest, right? Like, right. like man, shouldn't he be doing something new? Like, like didn't he already like <laughs> I, I, I didn't he already go down that path and 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 he already knows where the finish line is, and so uh, I, I love the idea of just just trying to figure out who you are, and who you who you can be, what's important to you, and and looking forward rather than than backwards and. I don't know that we talked, you know, about that in a couple of different ways. Yeah. Um, but that would be the thing that, that inspires me. And, and when I talk to people like you, I'm kind of like, Oh man, I love this because, you know, obviously you found something you're really good at, but you haven't been doing it for 20 years. You, right. You, how long have you been doing it? Right. Just a short, short amount of time. Yeah. Short amount. I love that. Started I, last I, year. I love, right. I, you know, I love that. Cause if you never, if you already knew the answer to who, who you are and who you could, what you could do and who you could be, you wouldn't be doing this. That's right? true. And, and that that's, I love that. So it, it's a fresh, optimistic, forward thinking, you know, I can definitely take something from that kind of attitude. So I would just tell people, go out and figure it out. Don't, don't know the answer to every question. Right. All right. I, I love it. Hey, and, and thank you for the, for the, for the comments and the compliments. Um, I'm definitely inspired by your story. You know, all of the different, journeys you've taken, be it, you know, writing, you know, writing your books or actually physically going on a journey across the country uh, and inspiring people, right? Just getting, getting into the emotions of it, um, getting into, you know, how people feel about a certain thing, right, is very impactful because a lot of us feel similar in certain circumstances, right? And we feel alone a lot of times, right? So just being able to talk to these individuals and, and tell their stories and let them tell their stories and, and how they feel, I believe is going to be a major impact in people's lives. Cause they're like, Oh, they're, they're going through this thing too. Right. And maybe I don't totally. have to feel this way, you know, while I'm going through it. So I really want to give kudos to you as well uh, for these books. And I look forward to your, your upcoming ones and projects as well. So I got to get caught up on a uh, cycle of lives because I haven't read that. But, um, but I'm interested. I, I re just read another book, and, and I know this is off topic. Uh, they were talking uh, same thing, um, just inspirational stories. And I think about six people uh, collectively mm -hmm. put a book together, right? And it was just telling a certain thing, an impactful thing that happened in their life, mm -hmm. and how they how they overcame that challenge, right? And those stories are impactful because we go through a lot of similar things as people. Right. But we feel like we're all alone. Right. But we feel like exactly, ex especially when it comes to cancer, abuse, yeah, uh, PTSD, addiction, those kind of things, man, you yeah. really feel like nobody gets me like, like nobody knows what I'm going through and you could be right. No, you nobody could be right. Know yeah. exactly what you're going through, but we kind of ha could have an idea and we certainly can empathize and connect with you on a deeper level. And, you know, I, I, I love one of the best side, uh, side effects of doing this, this project Lee was like, like I love uh, the idea that we don't know what people have gone through, but when you sit there and you talk to people and you, and you really talk to them and they open up, man, people go through a lot. Yeah. Like uh, everybody, everybody I know, everybody I spoke to, some weren't able to go talk about it all. Yeah. And, and some have been through worse things than others or better things than others, but, but but everybody goes through a lot. And when oh, you yeah. realize that it's kind of like you feel more connected because it's like, well, yeah, nobody understands me, but how in the world could I understand them? Yeah, You know, like we have that in common, man. Right. Like we're complex people that go through a lot of stuff. We have to process a lot of stuff. We have to deal with a lot of crap. And some of it was crap that was thrown upon us. And some of it is because we're just too stupid to know what we're walking into or whatever, but we all have all that in common. And so, if we could just figure out how to not uh, be so, so, so isolated, self-isolated, how, how not to abandon people that are going through something. Cause you know, it's like, Oh man, I could never do that. I could never understand that. Like it could just bring us closer. And, and that's, you know, that's the beauty of this kind of, this kind of work. Definitely. So David, thank you once again uh, for coming on hindsight, the podcast, uh, yes. everybody don't forget. Go to cycleoflives.org and check out David's work. 
Uh, you can also uh, get his books on, are they on Amazon? They're on Amazon, right? The Amazon, wherever books are sold. Wherever uh, books are sold. <laughs> wherever books are sold. <laughs> right. Continue the great work. Continue. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to go out there, but I know my body is not going to hold up on anything long. So maybe if, <laughs> if you're in San Diego and it's one of those, uh, what are you, what, what's the short ones? The mile and a half a or the sprint, three and a half? A sprint triathlon. Yeah, maybe. It, no, I'm not even going to do that. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe maybe I'll reach out to you and, and do some event. I think that would be great in the future. If you do, if you wouldn't mind, you just nice. let me know uh, what you're doing. I'll reach out to you at some point. And well, I'll, t- we I'll tell you what. Up. What's up? I tell you what, just just because we're we're still going. If anybody does want to do something that they shouldn't do, I just I just posted on my website a revised edition of a free book I'm giving away. Okay. It, it's it's seventy pages long, and it says a guidebook to your first five k, ten k, or sprint triathlon, and it talks about zero how to go from zero to a five k, ten k, or sprint triathlon, and it talks about nutrition and cycling and, and how to get gear and blah blah. blah. It, it's 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 a fast read, it's free, and and it's just it's it's the most basic of information to help you get from here to there, and and just here to there is like a five k, like three three miles. So I'm looking at the five k. So let me let me read that seventy page zero. Go to get that guidebook and you're five k. Like, All right, now I can go do it. Now I can then I'll start. It. I'll start getting myself together, and then I'll reach out to you, nice. see if you see if you'll do something with me. <laughs> okay, I love it. I love it. All right, David, you take care, all right? All right. Thanks, hindsight is twenty twenty. Hindsight is key. Hindsight is key. To learn that, you don't need no type of degree. degree. Learn from the past, see what the present gonna be. Yeah. I'm a wise man, look at these blessings on me. Whoa, whoa. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Hindsight is key. Hindsight is key. To learn that, you don't need no type of degree. Type of degree. Learn from the past, see what the present gonna be. Yeah. I'm a wise man, look at these blessings yeah. on me.